Now available in paperback and e-readers, Isis, Samurai Goddess, The Goddess Next Door takes on Kung Fu Killers in this action-packed martial arts Isis series adventure. Get Isis, Samurai Goddess, in paperback and e-readers today. I got a chance to take a look at Spider-Man Homecoming this weekend at the Magic Johnson, and for the first time in nine years, I am deeply disappointed at what Marvel Studios has presented, calling itself a Marvel Studios film, because the high bar for quality that was established with 2008's Iron Man and 2009's Captain America the First Avenger was not presented on screen with Spider-Man Homecoming. When I look at Spider-Man Homecoming, I start to see the beginning of the end for Marvel Studios. Now the first big problem I have with Spider-Man Homecoming is that unlike Iron Man and Captain America, there was no serious effort made towards preserving or staying authentic to the source material. Instead of giving us the story of Peter Parker from the Stan Lee and Steve Ditko comics, we got Miles Morales story transposed onto Peter Parker. And that adaptation was not what I came looking for in a Spider-Man movie. If this is supposed to be Spider-Man's homecoming, and he is your flagship franchise character, I would think you would want to make efforts to stay as true to the source material of Peter Parker from the comics, the same way you did with 2002's Spider-Man by Sam Raimi, that you would do for your 2017 third reboot. Now, in this third relaunch, it doesn't seem like they wanted to stay true to the source material. It seemed like Marvel wanted to continue trying to push its SJW diversity agenda that has gotten them a decline in sales regarding their whole publishing division. So they decided they wanted to push diversity with this Spider-Man movie. So in this movie, we've got Peter Parker's best friend, Pacific Islander. Um, he's, he's, he's chasing after a black girl. And there's another biracial girl played by Zendaya who's in the background, and, a, and there's a whole bunch of diversity characters placed in the story, and and Flash Thompson is an Indian, and we don't get any of Spider-Man's characters or Spider-Man's supporting cast. Now, that completely changes the story of Spider-Man, and that's not what I came to see. I came to see Peter Parker's story, not Miles Morales' story, or Miles Morales' world. And when I look at this story, I don't see Peter Parker's story presented the same way I saw it presented in 2002's Spider-Man. I see a completely different story, and that story is not true to the source material. When I look at this story, which takes Peter Parker out of his, out of his world and puts him into a new world, it's a completely different character. Because the Peter Parker from the comics was a kid who had to learn on his own. He had to learn how to do things on his own. That was part of the charm of his story is that he was this very smart kid who had, knew, had a thing for science and he was learning on his own, learning how to solve problems by himself, learning how to think critically by himself. But in this story, because you have Tony Stark giving Peter Parker a suit, that story is lost. Instead, we have this suit thinking for him, this suit doing things for him, and in some ways, that reminded me more of Terry McGinnis in Batman Beyond, not Peter Parker, the Amazing Spider-Man. Because in Batman Beyond, Peter, um, Terry McGinnis puts on a Batman suit and just starts, to become, starts fighting crime as Batman after his father is killed. And in this one, Tony Stark recruits Spider-Man to help out after Captain America Civil War. Then he's just given a suit with all these extra features. And all these extra features were things that Peter Parker learned how to do on his own in the old school Spider-Man comic. And I wanted to see this character learning how to use his abilities and powers uh, on his own and learning how to think critically. And we didn't get that. We were really cheated out of that, thanks to them giving him this suit ex machina. And this suit pretty much does all the things that Spider-Man had to learn on his own over the years. And I feel that that was a complete travesty to see this character's source material taken away from him because the whole Stark internship thing takes Peter Parker away from his way of making money at the Daily Bugle where he's taking pictures to make money on the side to do things and that takes him away from the action and again that takes him out of his source material because the way he found out about these bad guys, the way he found out about these crimes 
was working at the Daily Bugle and getting those leads from J. Jonah Jameson and Robbie Robertson. And that's where a good core chunk of his story came from. And they took that away. And when you take that away, he took away the heart of what Spider-Man was, what Spider-Man was about, a young guy trying to make it on his own, trying to learn things on his own. Now he's just a student of Tony Stark, and that's not Spider-Man. That's Batman Beyond posing as Spider-Man. It's Miles Morales and Terry McGinnis as saying that they're Peter Parker and putting on a Spider-Man suit, and that's not Spider-Man. That I'm sorry. What people saw on the screen was just not Spider-Man. And yes, I know that there's adaptation when it comes to films and that certain things are modified to fit the screen. But when it came down to this film, they took way too many liberties with this adaptation. In fact, they took so many adaptations that it completely deviated from the source material. And that was a major issue for me. And when it came down to the plot of this film, it didn't really feel like a cohesive story because they walked so far away from the source material. And because they walked so far away from the source material, I didn't feel like I was watching a Spider-Man movie the way I felt like I was watching an Iron Man movie come to life in 2008 and a Captain America movie. Those movies felt like comic books come to life. This felt like something completely different. And because it didn't stay true to the source material, it just became something else. And this is something I talked about in a video about my own characters and how when you take the one character and you change the ethnicity of the character or you change the um, uh, the lifestyle of that character, it completely changes the story. And what they did with Spider-Man was they completely changed his story in a way that is starting to deviate from the source material. And this is something I don't want to see regarding Marvel Studios. What made Marvel Studios a top studio was the fact that they've stayed true to their source material, stayed true to their characters, and made an effort to bring their characters come to life on the screen. And this was not presented in this Spider-Man Homecoming. Now with this plot, thanks to the deviations, we get all, it, this plot just fell apart for me right after the start of the film, because the film for Spider-Man Homecoming starts with uh, Adrian Toomes, and he's this owner of the salvage company, and he's trying to expand his business, and they, then we have Tony Stark and Damage Control, well, not Tony Stark, some government people come in, and they tell him that he's lost his contract, and instead of him turning over the material, he decides to take the material for himself. Now, that was a nice idea for talking about the Vulture and how he's a scavenger, and that's a nice metaphor for it, but it seems like after they made an effort to try to establish this villain, they just went and start. That's when the story started to fall apart for me because you had this interesting idea for a villain, but again, like Marvel Studios films previous, they just don't know how to develop a villain in a way that makes you care. Moreover, with this film, they just didn't know how to develop a story that made me care. It seemed like this film was more about continuity baggage than anything else. It seemed like there was this film was more like odds and ends of stories from previous films jumbled together and tried to put together as one story and it just didn't work. It just seemed like Spider-Man was stuck into a film that was just made to try to fit some odds and ends of continuity and use characters like Happy Hogan from previous films who we hadn't seen before and it didn't feel like a cohesive film. It didn't feel like a cohesive story and that had to do, I believe, with the five screenwriters they had on this film. And when you have so many screenwriters on a film, you're not going to get that cohesiveness in the story. You're not going to get that tightness of the plot. And you're not going to get really strong character development. And that was another big problem with Spider-Man Homecoming. These characters were just so poorly underdeveloped. I mean, I look at all these characters, and not a single one gave me a reason to care about them. I didn't feel any connection to anyone on screen. I didn't feel any sort of identification with anybody on screen. They did start with this Adrian Toomes by showing his struggles as a guy who was just trying to come up, but then no character development there. Just a lot of action happened for the sake of action, a lot of special effects for the sake of special effects, but there was no real heart on the screen because they deviated so far from 
the source material and they started trying to create something completely different from what Spider-Man was. So we didn't get that cohesiveness when it came to this story. And as we watch the story go on, it doesn't feel like a Marvel Studios superhero movie. It feels more like a satire of a Marvel Studios movie because the, the, what's on camera is Peter Parker bumbling and stumbling and then we have these cameos by Iron Man and then we have these Captain America um, public service ads which are supposed to be funny and the film is trying so hard to be funny that it loses the focus of what it's supposed to be about. If this film is supposed to be about Spider-Man learning about what it means to be a hero, I just didn't get that on screen as related to this film because the film felt more like a satire of a Marvel Studios film where they were poking fun at themselves rather than a cohesive film which told you a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. It felt like odds, again, odds and ends of other Marvel Studios films, a whole bunch of continuity baggage, and a whole lot of old plot points put together, but it did not feel like a cohesive, tight story. Now, this is starting to become a problem for Marvel Studios with its films, and I'm starting to see where they really aren't taking the audience seriously. It seems like they've gotten really caught up with the whole idea of telling jokes in these films and being funny. And yes, comic books have to have a little humor in them, but with this film, I'm starting to see where it's starting to become a bit excessive. Now, when it comes down to fantasy and superhero films, yes, you need moments of levity to give the audience a break from the world that they're escaping in. However, when you use too much humor, it takes the, the audience out of the story, and with this one, I started to feel like I was being taken completely out of the story because th there was no reason to care about anything. The plot really wasn't flowing smooth, and we didn't re really get to see Peter Parker using his brain because I found it odd that every time this kid had to try to figure out things for himself, he's got this suit ex machina to do things for him, and that's not really what... Spider-Man is all about. Spider-Man is supposed to be a young kid. He gets these powers. The tragedy happens and he learns what responsibility is. But now that Tony Stark is here, he doesn't have to learn how to be responsible for himself. And that, that really took away from what the story was because his story got completely lost in this film. Now they tried to, to try to put, put some type of story in there with him having this crush on this Liz, and then he has to go to this homecoming dance, and he has to choose in between the homecoming dance and stopping the vulture. But that really didn't come together for me as what responsibility would be for him. I mean, this kind of, it just felt off. It just felt uneven. It didn't feel like the lesson was there. It just, thanks to the jumbled and uneven writing, it just didn't come together. And thanks to the whole humor and satire that was overdone, you never got to see that message really conveyed in this story. And when I look at this Marvel at this Spider-Man Homecoming, I really start to see the beginning of the end for Marvel Studios. Because with this film, as I stated before in a previous video, I'm starting to see that decline that I saw similar to the one in the late 1990s with Disney's animation golden age. Now right after Beauty and the Beast and the Lion King we really started to see Disney start to get cocky and full of itself and they weren't really paying attention to the quality of their films and after that they released Hunchback of Notre Dame, Mulan, Tarzan, all entertaining films but clearly the level of quality had declined and when they got to Treasure Planet that's when we really started to see the huge decline for Disney films and that's when the animation golden age started to hit towards the end and with Home on the Range the nail was put in the coffin because that's when they stopped taking things seriously and they started going towards the lay, lay of self parody because when I look at the Spider-Man Homecoming I see them heading more towards satire and self parody and that's not something people want to see that feels very like you're smug, you're full of yourself, you believe that you're so great, and you're not taking this craft very seriously, you're not taking the source material very seriously, and you're not taking the stories that you were asked to present very seriously, you're not taking the audience very seriously, 
And when you tell the audience that you're not very serious about things, the audience finds other things to do with its money. And that was what I, the way I felt after watching this Spider-Man Homecoming. I felt like going and walking away from Marvel Studios films after the Spider-Man Homecoming because the quality for excellence just wasn't in this film. It felt like they were taking some bits and pieces of a story, taking continuity baggage, and slapping it together and calling it a film around their flagship character, not making the effort to craft a solid story around their flagship character. Now I look at this film and I look at how poor quality it is and I, and after comparing it to Wonder Woman which I saw a couple of weeks ago I'd have to honestly say Patty Jenkins did a better job on Wonder Woman than the director of Spider-Man Homecoming did for Marvel Studios because Patty Jenkins in spite of having really a terrible script and not the greatest actress in the world in Gal Gadot made an effort to put together a pretty solid quality film. The acting on that film was high above the script and the cinematography and the camera work were high above the quality of what she was given. She elevated that material to another level and gave us a film that had the potential to become a classic. She made it a serious effort on in that making that Wonder Woman movie and I'd have to say that that Wonder Woman was far better than this Spider-Man Homecoming. What I saw on the screen with the Spider-Man Homecoming was the smugness of Marvel Studios, the cockiness of Marvel Studios, and I saw a company that is going to be in serious trouble sooner rather than later because once you start believing your own hype and you stop making efforts to produce quality films, you start to slip. And I can see the slipping starting with the Spider-Man Homecoming and I'm starting to see the decline of Marvel Studios with this film. The film that they produced was not top quality. It did not make that serious effort to respect the source material and respect the audience the way it did in 2008. And in some ways it was like it was making fun of the audience that it acquired in 2008 by, make, by presenting us with this poor quality adaptation of its flagship character. What I saw in Spider-Man Homecoming reminded me so much of what I saw in Superman 3 back in 1983 and back then the Salkins made the same mistake that the producers of Spider-Man 3 made not, not, not Spider-Man 3, um, Spider-Man Homecoming made uh, in Superman 3 in 1983 your Salkins thought oh we can add more humor and make Superman more relatable to the audience and they went out of their way to go get the Richard Pryor to be a part of the Superman movie and that made for a forced, very awkward film and a very poor quality story overall where the story just did not come together. And that was the start of the beginning of the end of the Superman franchise, this Superman 3. And when I look at Spider-Man Homecoming, I'm starting to see the beginning of the end of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And if they don't get it together, we may not be seeing many more Marvel Cinematic Universe movies because if the quality stays at this level, I'm seeing them headed towards that same rock bottom that killed Disney's 1990s golden age and destroyed the Superman franchise and the Batman franchise. I cannot recommend Spider-Man Homecoming to anyone. This is not a good Marvel Studios film. This is not a good adaptation of Spider-Man. If you want to get a great adaptation of Spider-Man that stays true to the source material, I urge you to go get Sam Raimi's 2002 Spider-Man. That film stays true to who Peter Parker is and maintains a high level of quality throughout. If you like what you see on this channel and you want to help me make more videos, you can donate to my Patreon by clicking the link in the description box. And if you want to try some of my SJS Direct Universe titles, you may do so by clicking the link to Amazon.com in the description box. That's all I have to say for this video. You can comment, rate, and subscribe.